couple of you have asked for videos on Welsh play sims, be they in Wales or elsewhere. And so this video is for you. But for those of you visiting this channel, I hope that you enjoy this because it's not just to do with Welsh place names, it's about Welsh culture and wider British identities. So let's jump into the video. When you are looking for their roots, Welsh roots and names in England, there are things you need to know. The first is that this was the indigenous culture and that you had a wave, like imagine a wave of water hitting the island from the southeast. Okay, and so if you look at the map from that position, looking at where the mountains are and some of the defensive low bits, you can see where the names continued to be Welsh longest was where the water would have hit least in the first few waves. We begin with that in mind by going to one of South East England's most defendable positions, and that's the Chilterns, which would have been a strong Romano-British and Welsh enclave for a considerable amount of time. You can see these behind me, these Chilterns for South England are quite a high up position. They overlook the Thames River Valley and they give you a broad perspective on multiple sides. It was a good place to retreat to. And this was probably Welsh speaking as late as, you know, the, the beginning of the seventh century in some places, which is really late. People romanticize Rhenogladd, which I'll get to in a bit. But this was speaking Welsh in much of the same time, and it deserves our attention. We come. We is water. Was. It'd be gwe today. And com, we think cum. Com, this probably entered the Anglo Saxon language here from this area. So you have a couple in this area with the word pen in them, which means the head of kind of a headland and Wendover, which would mean something like fair water or white water. Most of these are to do with water and mountain, very basic things, but you don't have much this obvious in a cluster like this in most of South England. This is quite rare. It means that there was a significant density of Welsh speakers here for a very long time. And you do get suggestions of political happenings and names like Catmaur in the Chilterns, which would have been pronounced at the time Catmaur. Great battle. There's probably a battle that happened here between Saxons and Britons, which maybe the Welsh wanted to remember it because we won it and ensure that this area was Welsh speaking a bit longer, but we don't know. In any case, the Chilterns is quite significant because we took the most defensive position. We held it for a very long time, comparatively to the rest of the surrounding regions. We didn't just give this island up. This went on for centuries, but it's not just the high bits that we took. We took some of the lowest land in Britain as a defense, which I'll show you next, which some might think that's not characteristically Welsh, people of the mountains. No, we are people of a Britain, all of it. And we're not just a mountain people. It's not surprising that the Welsh took to the fens as a defense because it's defensible. And in terms of population density, this had vestiges of heritage going back to the first risings against Rome. And there was a significant population of Britons here who would have remembered who they were because of that. And so in this area, just north, northwest of Cambridge, you get a significant pocket of two types of names. One, native British, and two, words beginning with wall or walls. Walton, Welsh farm, or f farm of the Welsh. 
wool socken, wool pole, probably something like Welsh pool. <laughs> That's ironic. Welsh pool in Wales is a tradition. And these walls endings proliferate Britain. Warney, up north, Welsh Island. Wales in more than one place, meaning that area over there, they speak that language, the Britons. But what about the names of these places that were not walls? What about the Britons themselves? You get Wiesbach, which probably meant Wiesbach, little water, or maybe even a little island in the Uis. It may have been what the water was called, and this was clearly an island at that point, before the fens were drained. Chatris. This chat meaning of the wood, of the woods, and red, oh crossing, a ford over water. And this chat, you get this over and over, this ch sound, because of how the Saxons heard it. When you have ch and da or ta separated by a vowel at the beginning of a word, that's usually an indication this was a Welsh place, regardless of what they say. And the Welsh appear to have been speaking Welsh here perhaps as late as the 8th, maybe in some cases the 9th century. That changes the entire history of this island. It wasn't just the Saxons came in and that was it. No. If you were enjoying this content, just tap that like button for me. It really helps. Let's get back to the video. One thing you need to know is that the Romans built a series of towns on old tribal centers along the south coast of England. And when Rome withdrew, the Romano Britons, who had to a large extent held on to their culture in places, began to re establish their old capitals and a lot of their old ways of life to try and rebuild what they had. In some places they wanted to carry on the Roman administration. And one of these towns was near present day Pevensey, which in Welsh would be Andred. The fort was called Andretum, the Roman fort. And this was taken from the British language, from Ande and Rid, which means and they, today would be go in well, making things big. And read is read in Welsh, a ford. So great ford. And by the time the Romans were withdrawing, this became known as Andred. And the Romano Britons built a small kind of civitas on the Roman model and began to build the foundations of a very small kingdom. But in the year 471 or 477, somewhere in there, the Saxons attacked it and killed most of the population and drove many of the Romano Britons into the forest to the north. And this became known as Andred's Weld. That weld bit is a forest in Saxon. And in a lot of these places where you see weld, or wield. You have small little bits in the middle of these ancient forests that have Welsh place names or Welsh elements within them. Because what happened is, after, especially on the south coast where you had towns and then forests beyond, kind of on the ridge above, beyond and over and down again, you had Britons who were pushed into the forest by these tribes these Germanic tribes invading, and they organized a resistance in the forest to try and keep their culture going. And in some cases, there's evidence that they organized a group and attacked back to try and retake these civitases. And in this area, just above present day Pevensey, you have a collection of names which are a bit odd. I mean, Catsfield. You wouldn't think that that's British, you'd think that's Anglo-Saxon and so on, that's English. But that 
chat that that to me seems like it would be battle and on its own I wouldn't think anything of it but you have this pond screen one down the road and then up toward a ridge you have Penhurst I mean obviously the end of the words Germanic but that pen is like the headland and you have this odd one Baldle Street down and to me Baldle looks a lot like Baldle like the place the, the, the dwelling place you can see how one they'd be mishmash into English and the original idea that it even came from Welsh would be clearly forgotten over the centuries and if it was just one on its own I wouldn't think anything of it but you have a collection of them that could be this and if you look deeper in this area you find quite a few that oh well that that could be that in Welsh and that could be that and it happens so that in England if you see an area like this where there's a few names in, a, in an area like a few square miles where they have elements in them that could be British and you're not really quite sure but you, you see them sprinkled about that means usually that that was a pocket of Welsh speakers that held out for a century or two longer that happens a lot in these areas above these old Roman forts where the Britons fled into the forest and organized a resistance. At some point the Britons were like, well, we're making a stand. We can't just run into the forest each time they take one of our cities. One of these was at present day Bokerley's Dyke. Now a lot of these dikes and fortifications are scattered around in the post-Roman period in South England. And what was happening is in that period, 400 to 500 especially, the Romano Britons were resurrecting these fortifications and trying to establish defenses to hold on to their country from these waves of that were attacking their land and one of these was here between it's kind of on the border between Hampshire and Dorset and you can see on this map here there's this Pentridge settlement just behind it it was the headland of the ridge that that pen that that's Welsh and so they built this, they resurrected this defensive line on this defensive ridge to try and hold them back. And if you look at this line here on the map now, there's this line here that, that the Britons do stop the Saxons along these ridges here. For a time, there's, we don't know if there was a settlement or an agreed peace, but the Saxon advance for a moment stops. And along this ridge, from this point going westward, you get more and more Welsh sounding names and eventually into Cornish. And the names of uplands especially have Welsh or early British roots. A bit west of this line you get Chidioc, which comes from Coidioc, forested. That ch duh again. When the Saxons came, they pronounced it ch. And a lot of Welsh words ending in da or ta or the, they all pronounced it da. So when you're going through England and you see words, especially in areas that were forested, have this chid, ched, chod, chid sound. That's an indication that this was a British settlement. Going along this line, you get cheddar, like the cheese. And where does this come from? Kedur. Hollow water, the hollow that the water goes through. You may sell the cheese, but it's our name. It's our name. Glasgow, way up in Scotland, that go at the end comes from K as well. It's all over the place. It was the same language from Cheddar to Glasgow. And at the end of this arc toward the Severn Sea, as we call it in Welsh. You get Breen, which comes from Bryn Hill. You get a lot of variations of Bryn across England like this, especially going west. These defensive lines kept forming 
going west. The Mendips. The Mendbit? That comes from a British language. Either Monith, mountain, or mine, stone. The Dipa bit. That's, that's Saxon. And you get that a lot. Increasingly going down the southwestern peninsula. The fusion of Saxon and Welsh. Or what would be Cornish later on in these names. The Contoc Hills come from Cantoc, Old British for a circle, and it defined, described the way the hills were shaped. The highest point in these hills is called Will's Neck. So many of these words are quite meaningless, but what this means is the ridge of the Welshman. This was the ridge that beyond it were the foreigners in the eyes of the Saxons, even though the foreigners were the British and the Saxons were the foreigners, but anyway. And near Yeovil, you do get a place called Wales. We know what that means. There were Welsh speakers there. Bramich. That's what I call Birmingham and Welsh. My own personal invention, but I'm going off of Bromwich, which is an older Anglo Saxon bit. And these names, these early Anglo Saxon names, they didn't just pop up. There were people here before them, before the Anglo Saxons. Where did they come from? And so when they reached about Bromwich, you have names appearing like Walsall. The Hollow of the Welsh. And just up over that, you have an area called Cannock, which I can't say what this would have meant in Old Welsh. And the etymology dictionaries don't say that it's Welsh, but I, I feel that that, that that word feels Welsh. And if it was just on its own, I might say, okay, maybe that's just Anglo-Saxon, but you have Walsall indicating the people coming from the southeast up toward this kind of low valley, the people toward the higher end of it, they said, well, that they're Welsh up in that hollow. And beyond that was Cannock. And then you get Pencrig to the west, which meant the headland of the heather, Pencridge today. And then a bit further north, you get Lichfield. Lichfield is a good one to bring up for multiple reasons. Not just the name and where it comes from and where it went, but of the political and ecclesiastical significance in terms of the Mercian kingdom that was forming now in the late fifth going into the sixth century. It became a Romano-British civitas named Leto Ketum. Ket. Coid. Chet becomes CH so often. And in Welsh, Luitgoid, grey wood. And this defines the trees, the elms and the ashes that are so prosperous in the area. But when it became Saxonized, something happened that was very unusual. This was a Romano-British Christian center. And as Mercia expanded from the northeast out of the Upper Dufferin Tranon, that's the Trent River Valley, the upper valley of that. They moved their ecclesiastical center to Lichfield. And as Mercia was emerging, it was the last major Anglo Saxon kingdom to emerge. Because for a time, it was not certain was it going to swing being British speaking and a Welsh kingdom, or was it going to become an Anglo Saxon kingdom? It went back and forth. And Mercia comes, it means, people of the borderland. This was the borderland between the Saxon and the British settlements. And as Mercia expanded out of this upper Tranon Valley, Trent, and absorbing Lichfield as a center of power, it took in a lot of these British areas and made them gradually Anglo-Saxon. And as the kingdom expanded, it took over Lindsay, in the east, and this is something Welsh speakers need to understand, Lindsay 
had been a British kingdom originally in the very early days, but it was the northwest of Mercia that remained deeply Welsh speaking for a long time and going further and further west. You get names like Holdnet, Howlnant, Easy Brook, Easy Flowing Brook. And you get this peak, I'll put it on the screen here. The Reckon. And what this is, is Weirkorn, probably, the men of the horn. Maybe Weirkamrogi, men of our fellow compatriots. But what this appears to have been was a remains over from the Cornovi tribe who regathered after Rome and began to reassess and reestablish their authority. And then going up into Lancashire, you get loads of them as you creep up the Pennines, the Penwinion, which I'll get to in a moment. You get Haydock, which comes from Haydock, full of barley. And a lot of these names ending in O-C-K throughout England come from a British source rather than an Anglo-Saxon one. In the same area you get Kilchith, Narrow Wood. Kingdoms began to emerge that were British speaking and staunchly British just to the north. Leeds comes from a British source, something like Le Danswys, something meaning akin maybe to people of the Broad River, Broad Valley. Rhenoglev, the Old North. This was a time when it looked for a brief moment like the British would reassert themselves across much of England and kingdoms arose like Ragged up in Cumbria, probably parts of Lancashire and across into Scotland. And Leeds, which produced the area around it produced Elved, which was based around the Penwinion. You get lots of different words beginning with pen throughout these regions. You get Kisdun, which means small fort in quite old British, but it's up in Cumbria, where if you want to see Welsh place names, Pendrith from Pendrith, Cardirnog, meaning the, the fortress of the, the knotted fist is Cardirnog. You get Blythe, means blithe, wolf, Levenet is something like Llevenith. This would have been a, a, the name for a region. Helvelin, probably Helvelin. Uh, you get a couple ones beginning with L-A-N, which come from Llan. Kind of a holy enclosure. Mainly in the Old North, the place names survive kind of in the in the, the snug of the, the Pennines, where they were protected both from the advancing Northumbrians and the Vikings coming in off the sea. And there's this the valley of the River Eden. This is clearly a very strong area for place names. And so going back to the beginning when I said that the place names, which reflect a Welsh origin in Britain, reflect where if you were going to position yourself to withstand a burst of water across Britain, the most defendable positions from that flood in are where they persisted. And on the opposite side of the Pennines is obviously one of them. I didn't want this video to be just an endless spew of names telling you what they mean. It's just to tell you how to find them and that the areas where they're found are usually in clumps, clusters, in areas that would have been more defendable from like a wave of immigration coming in, assimilating out the native population. From that point of view, 
They're usually at headland areas where you find that pen. They're usually in upland valleys where you get that coom or in big thick forests where the population was able to organize some kind of resistance. If you have made it this far, thank you very much for watching. This is a lot of work to do and I need your help if I'm going to make this a full-time job. Please join me on Patreon, you can donate every month. Or if you just want a small tip, there's a join button down below where you can give a super like. If not, hey, thank you very much for watching. Every little bit helps and we will see you in the next episode next time.